All right, good evening. Uh, welcome to the City of Sunbury Services Committee meeting, first one of the new year, January 4th, 2023. Can I get a roll call? Mr. Kaplan? Here. Mr. Neff? Here. Mrs. Cooper? Here. And Mr. Mayor St. John is not here. Um, I am going to motion to approve the minutes from the December 7th, 2022 meeting. Second. Second by Mr. Neff. Uh, roll call? Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Neff? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Abstain. All right. Uh, next up is the visitor section. Does anybody uh, want to speak to the services committee? If not, we will move on to wastewater treatment plant business, which is one of my favorite topics. Thank you. I wanted to provide uh, the committee a quick update on the wastewater treatment plant improvement project, a very large project for the city. Dale's here this evening, so that works out well. Um, so if you go to page four of the agenda, uh, we just have a one page summary there covering what we've gone over. Our team's been meeting with Dale every two weeks. So to date, we've covered HeadWorks, which is all the uh, influence screening and grit removal facilities, the uh, aerobic tanks, the site, some, some site improvements, clarifiers, UV disinfection, sludge dewatering. And we've also worked through that uh, property acquisition from the high school, that five acre piece that we're gonna take north of this property. So each, each meeting's basically been focused on one of those items. Um, our design team works through all the detail with Dale. So we've been going through that and that's, that's worked out well so far. Um, to do are the oxidation ditches, which are the large oval tanks there you see on the site if you've ever been back there. And then we, we need to work through the administration building and what improvements are gonna occur to the administration building. So things are well on track. Um, just going down to, to the schedule section there, it's an overview of the schedule. Definitely on track for a PTI submittal the end of March, which is our Ohio EPA submittal with about a 75% set of plans, the permit forms, the fee, and then the state at that point takes that and reviews it. We plugged in 120 days for the review time. Um, hopefully it would, would be quicker, but um, they are behind schedule on a lot of projects throughout the, the state, so that could be a variable on the schedule. Looking at bid advertisement then in, in uh, July, um, and then in the real target here is the August construction loan application. So hopefully we will have good bid numbers then to apply for, nominate for construction loan dollars through Ohio EPA at that point. Um, one thing I bet that I will mention that's not on the update list is uh, one of the next steps is we need to do an amendment to our design loan. So we currently have a planning and de design loan for the work that we've done already that we need to amend that and take take into account the current design loan. We'll work with um, Steve, Daryl, and Dana on that to get the paperwork over to you. Uh, move, moving on to construction, um, looking at the construction period. Right now we have plugged in October 26 through April of 2025. So in a nutshell, I'm hoping to get the plant up and running by spring to early summer of 2025 is the goal. So that's a big picture overview, a um, lot of detail there would offer to uh, meet anybody at the plant with our design team during one, one of the meetings. If you'd like to do a walkthrough, see, see the drawings. Um, we included in the packet in the, the, the OneDrive folder, a copy of the site plan. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other drawings in addition to, to that site plan. So if you're interested in any more detail, I would invite you to come to one of the meetings or we can do a separate walkthrough or a meeting if you're interested. Yeah, I would love to do walk through over there. It occurred to me too, because um, Cindy's new to this committee as of today. Congratulations. And uh, Murray's fairly new to council. I just wondered if either of you have been gotten a tour of the treatment plant yet. You have. He has. I have. Okay. 
So yeah, that'd be really yeah. good to make yeah. that happen. So sure. sure. Could could you take us on a tour? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I've been meeting with Dan. Uh, we're in a Monday morning at 10. Okay. Uh, you know, the holidays, I don't change. So we can always work out if you want to meet with them also. Okay. But anytime, anybody's welcome. Email me, phone call me, dial in. Yeah. I don't want to say that's basically the first because I'm not out there. So. Don't surprise you. All right. <laughs> Any questions on the updates? Thanks. All right. Uh, up next, also dealing with sewer department, we've got industrial vacuum truck. So where are we on this? So, you are good, yeah. Oh, thank you. We, um, our current back home truck is 18 years old. And uh, the fact that we have seen five CDL drivers leave in the past five years made us look into a non-CDL truck. And uh, I wasn't crazy about that first, but after we demoed one, I was shocked at how much power these things have. These trucks, we looked at a pipe hunter truck. These trucks are made by a by pipe hunter in Texas. They're sold by a company called MTech out of Cleveland. And um, Entech has a pretty good reputation. I bought things from them before. Um, everything about this truck was this this truck is actually half, looks half the size of the one we have, but it's twice as powerful. So what they're doing with these trucks now is um, using uh, less volume of water and higher pressure to clean these main lines our main lines in town are all eight to ten inch these trucks are, are more than enough to take care of that so they're they just look smaller but they're more powerful and uh so we demoed the pipe hunter and we also there's no there's not a lot of comparables out there vacker is another one you might have a you have a pamphlet on that one so uh vacker is is probably got the best name in the business uh, they are made in Illinois, uh, sold by Jack O'Haney Company, which is a huge company. And they're out of Cincinnati, our, would be our closest rest here. But the, the Pipe Hunter truck is, is uh, more of a truck. They got bigger blowers. They got more volume for water. Uh, and as far as a small truck, They've been, um, they got the reputation right now for these smaller trucks. So um, the reason we're looking at these is, as I stated, ours is 18 years old. I had a uh, problems with it two months ago, and just to find parts for it was uh, quite a feat. So it's time. It's time to replace it. And uh, I think this. Honestly, I think the pipe on our truck is the one we need. And uh, it's just a good truck. Uh, we, we had it up here. We demoed it. Uh, the differences between this truck and what we have is this truck has a positive displacement blower, which means the vacuum side ha has a, um, their rotary load blowers. You might want to compare it only compare it to your home air compressors, but it's it it's pressurized air and cavities. Our truck up there has fan blowers, which is what they used to do, and municipalities bought them all over because they were much cheaper at that time. But the real difference is, without explaining all that, is a fan blower. If you have to 
uh, suck something out of a manhole or a tank or something. The pipe and stuff that you put in there, you have to hold with a paint where you have to hold that pipe above the surface because as any fan, you, you have to have air so before it starts actually working. Positive displacement of water, you can set that pipe for the bottom of the tank and start pumping. So that's the big difference in that. Um, pipe hunter compared to Vactor has a stronger positive displacement pump. Um, they're real close. Has a heavier chassis than the Vactor truck. So, um, all the information's in there. If you guys got any questions about these trucks, uh, I would say we use these trucks when we're fully staffed and no emergencies are going on, which is not very often. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we use these trucks four days a week, three in the field and one at the plant, just cleaning. You say the one that you have right now is 15 years old? 18. 18 years old. What's the estimated lifespan on one of these? Seven years. All right. Any fleet you talk to, any fleet manager in the world will tell you keep the truck seven years. I don't know if that's a life expectancy, but that's when you start. They they realize that's when you start uh, start looking at other trucks. Seven years. Mm -hmm. A lot of diminishing mm -hmm. returns. Right. Um, you know, our truck does our truck not out on the highway for 100,000 miles, mm -hmm. but the hours on it is pretty far up there. So, can I depose the witness just for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Deputy Chief Wampler of the sewer department. Um, what would be operator of record? <laughs> operator senior extraordinaire. Would it be fair to say that you're fairly skeptical and you do a lot of due diligence when you look into your new equipment? Absolutely. So before I even demoed this, I did a lot of research. Um, like I say, at first I thought we don't, we're not going that direction. We don't need a smaller truck. But after the research, it's it's like everything else. It's improved so much for putting a dynamite package in a smaller truck, you know. And I can tell you this pipe on our truck, whoever built it and put this together has probably worked with these trucks because. It's right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I definitely researched it before I even called them with demo. We demoed a uh, uh, a new truck. The truck they brought up here was not the demo truck. Mm -hmm. So because that truck was in Georgia being rented out because of somebody in Georgia needed the demo truck <laughs> on the job site. Just because it was required to be there. I don't think it was used a lot. So the truck, Steve yep. and Daryl was up there. They seen that that was actually a brand new truck. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I was just going to add, we do have the pricing information in the packet as well. Pricing information. Uh, if For I would recommend one, I would definitely recommend the pipe hunter. So packet, packet page 10. Available. Uh, I think the back of trucks. I don't think they would even start building all this for until the third quarter of 2023. So probably right, takes 10 months to build them. So we would be looking at 2024 to get on all those. But the pricing is it's all in here. Uh, 247. Uh, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, so packet page 10. Page 10. Yeah. Um so the demo truck, I think they said 275. 275. Yeah. And then the if it were a new truck, it'd be more like 350. <clears throat> the 347 number there. That's the the pipe hunter truck. And then the Vactor price is at 326, 327. So you know it's an expensive purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, I think if I remember correctly, this is on the um capital improvement plan. Uh, but not as a purchase for next year, um, at least not initially. Um, but we do have it factored in, I think, actually next year, the following year. We did. Um, we have $350,000 appropriated for sewer lighting. Yep. And Dale and I had this conversation that those funds could be utilized. It's for fewer people. You know, yep. so this would be a capital purchase. 
So if you yeah. wanted to substitute those funds for that contract, that's a possibility in 2023. Or you could pull forward the you know the expenditure for the for the next year, just add it to the appropriation this year. Of course, we'd have to come back with a budget revision to do that. What kind of time frame to get one of those uh, pipe hunter trucks? You said that the Vactor ones would. Uh, there's two available now: the mm -hmm. one, the demo, and the new one. And like any salesman, they're ready to sell them to some mm -hmm. <laughs> so they, they, they ended up having a lot, and a lot of people do that. Yeah, thanks for the recommendation, Dan. Yeah. Sorry I deposed you earlier. I, I knew you were excited. I knew you've been putting a lot of work to this. Um, I knew you were skeptical going into the the smaller truck, even the demo. I was like, you yeah, know, we'll try it out. Yeah. And then uh, I saw the Jubilee in your email response, like, hey, this thing's pretty good. <laughs> it's going to work out great. Um, do you have a, does staff and collectively have a recommendation on new versus uh, the demo? I think the uh, the general consensus was that the demo probably uh, may be the best option, particularly in light of how limited use they've got on their demo and the and the cost differential seventy five thousand. Mm -hmm. You do lose a little bit on the warranty side, um, but again, as Dale's indicated, it doesn't look like that demo has been under a lot of uh, intense use. Yeah, I would I would definitely have them bring that demo down or drive a fleet and take a good look at it before we. Wrote a check or whatever that works, yeah. you know. So, because I haven't seen the demo, I haven't seen okay. the new one. But he sent me pictures, and and Entech, I do know this Entech has a real good reputation for taking care of their demos and rails. And, uh, you know, it's a good company. There, there's probably 30 employees with this company. Uh, they do have that reputation. So I'm not too worried about a demo truck in this company. And I think the savings, I mean, it's seventy two thousand four hundred some dollars. It's a twenty twenty two truck. The demo's twenty twenty two. So that's a decision that you guys can weigh out. Sounds good. Yeah, that's any other questions. Right. Oh, that's great. Thank Thanks you a lot, lot Christian Wampler. <clears throat> great job. All right. Next up is Berkshire Township uh, Winter Services Road Maintenance Agreements. So, a um, couple, man, probably Page 15. A month ago, we met with <laughs> Berkshire Township. Um, because of the annexation related to DRK, we were having responsibility for part of three B's and K Road, and um, it's a long way out to run for our trucks. And um, in other communities that I've been in, um, sometimes you sit down with the township and you figure out if there's a reasonable trade that makes sense for both parties. And um, this way, you know, what we what we tentatively agreed to is they will continue to maintain three B's and K, and we would pick up a section of Cheshire Road. Um, that keeps us much, you know, four miles closer to Sunbury. It's, you know, we're getting to a point where we're going to have to be ducking into rolling hills and price ponds. It just made uh, pretty reasonable sense to to do that trade. So we've got a, a an agreement for winter services that we've negotiated with them. We'll let Mr. Bream give it a read through. Um, it's solely about dropping a plow and dropping salt and who's going to do what where. But uh, it makes sense for us to, uh, to trade off. Yeah, I think we're picking up a little bit of road miles for the amount of salt and plowing, but we're cutting out four miles of getting over to three B's and K road to be able to do that. So um, in terms of our routing, it, it makes a lot more sense. And um, 
I guess it's just an informational thing. Um, we'll let Mr. Bream weigh in if you need to approve me to enter into this agreement with them or not. But um, we thought we would at least um, memorialize it in an agreement with, with Berkshire Township. So maybe you hit on this. Were we already going to have some responsibility for Golf Course Road as it was? Yeah. Yes, with the uh, with Rolling Hills and Price mm -hmm. coming in, we would have been um, accepting some of that. Yeah, that that's another piece of it. But uh, seems like a smart deal then. It's a reasonable way to keep our our plows close, and they keep their plows more appropriate to where they need to be working and. Um, you know, you can revisit it every, every, you know, before the winter and see if it still makes sense or not. So then once uh, Mr. Bream has a chance to look at it, may or may not come before council? Correct. Okay. I'll either, he says I can sign it, I'll sign it. If it needs to be formally done, then we'll formally do it at the next meeting. Sounds good. I think in this most recent snowstorm, they already had a handshake agreement to do this, if I'm not yes. mistaken. I rode with Brad on Cheshire Road and we were plowing it. <laughs> yeah, we pretty much yeah, did a verbal, yeah, let's let's do it this way and see how it works. Mm -hmm. All right. I see a bit about stormwater utility. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm looking forward to this. Do you want to do the um, traffic and the thoroughfare and traffic? Did I first? skip one? Sorry, again? I have a very, very bad habit of doing that. Quick update on that before we get into um, Mr. Whited's presentation. Yes. So, quick update on the on the signal timings. We finished our um, call it a mini study, which kind of concentrated on Cherry Miller State Route Three. There, there were four intersections. I'll mention those in a minute took a look at the AM peaks, PM peaks, um, and then the off peak period for the high school dismissal time period. Tweaked all, all the, the uh, yellow, uh, the, the green, yellow, red, and the pedestrian intervals as well. So we, we hope it's a 20 to 30% increase in efficiency moving traffic through all those intersections. So um, have the timing sheets done. Steve, Daryl, and Brad spoke. Um, they're comfortable getting that information to MP Dory. I just asked our team, who is the signal contractor? I just asked our team if there's any specifics that MP Dory has to, to tell me, and I'll pass that on as soon as I get it. Um, so we're ready to get a quote from them and retime those four intersections. And the four intersections, just for clarity, Cherry Street, State Route 3, I'm sorry, the first intersection was Cherry and Miller, Cherry and Three, um, State Route Three and Miller, and South Miller and Heartland. And the four intersections that'll be retimed. So, all completed, ready to go, and retimed. So, we think M MP Dory would be in the three, four, five thousand range. I'm not sure what their time will be. So, that's should, should be pretty cost effective for a significant improvement. So. Has the Kinder uh, Cherry intersection been tweaked recently? Not that we would or anybody would okay. have done. Is it? I felt the pulsing effect the other day, I guess, is you know, we're trying to create a gap. So Cheshire Road, um, there's a little bit of space in there. I, I've just noticed that uh, the traffic light is stopping on Cherry Street. Um, I wouldn't say it's unnecessarily stopping because it's creating a gap for Cheshire. I just didn't know if somebody actually made a change or not. Okay. No. Magic. So okay. it's, it's like stopping when there's an undetected entry from Kintner. Right. Yeah. It was doing a left turn signal on. So if you're heading West left turn signal on Kintner and there's nobody there. Okay. Um, plus that's like a stub anyways. And uh, it's creating a little bit of a gap. And I'm like, oh, okay, somebody did that. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, stormwater. So Dan White is here from our office. Um, introduced Dan. He's been a great addition to our team recently. And he's prepared a PowerPoint on the stormwater utility. 
We, we could have had you on Zoom, Dan. Oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> I, I stay out of the house once in a while. I haven't been out of the house much. All right. Been uh, been on lockdown. Well, uh, thank you for listening to me tonight. I've got a, I wouldn't call it a short presentation, but it's not too long. Um, and I'll go through it uh, re relatively quickly, but please feel free to stop me any time for questions. And I've got my notepad up here. I'll take notes and make sure I record anything that you've got for concerns. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Huh. Are you on the PDF and not the? I might be. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you'd already had it pulled up on the, on the bottom there. Yeah. That's the PowerPoint? Yeah. Oh. You want to turn it into a slideshow? Hit the slide button. Bottom right. A little bit further. Right. Almost. Thanks. I had to have my graphics in there. Um, so this this is what we'll talk about. We'll be late to this agenda, but just really to kind of introduce you to this um, concept of stormwater utility. You go ahead and hit the hit the button. I'll be telling you to click a lot. Uh, this in our uh, you authorized to go ahead with the feasibility study, and this was task one of that, which was a concept review. Um, and these are the sorts of things that we had a meeting with uh, Daryl and Steve and Brad not too long ago, and it was virtually this almost exact same presentation, but we went through these and some detail. Now in that soil water conservation district did a little bit more. But that's the first phase is kind of what we're doing now. The second step, go ahead and hit the button is to um to have a workshop. And that workshop would consist of stakeholders, um, your fire chief, uh, some representatives from the business community, particularly those that have large and various areas, um, yourselves and, and anybody that you think would be important to get engaged in this, whether they're an advocate or not. If they're not an advocate, we need to, to educate them and, and Hopefully, convert them to our, to our side. Uh, you go ahead and hit it down. So it's not like uh, this. It's not like this is something new. All the cool kids are doing it. Uh, there's uh, about 2,000. Actually, more. This this uh, graphic is from 1998. Uh, I'm sorry, it's from 2019. Um, there's so considerably more of them now. There's over 111 of them here in Ohio. Um, I've actually had the opportunity to work on with a few of those, and uh, they're quite handy when you have stormwater issues. Next slide. Well, so what is a utility? Well, it's a dedicated funding mechanism, um, just like any other utility. It allows you to collect money for users. I know it's hard to consider stormwater a use, but it is. it really is because water hits your site, it leaves your site, and impacts others, impacts the environment, and has a <clears throat> sometimes a... Uh, a bad effect on the on the community, particularly with flooding and such. Um, it'll assist with compliance with environmental mandates, which can continue to get more and more intense every year. Um, helps address aging infrastructure. And I'll, I'll introduce uh, a little bit about our aging infrastructure here later in the presentation. And it will, so it provides a consistent revenue stream to use for those things and, and other issues related to stormwater. Thanks. Um, and it's based on typically, not always, but typically it's based on their extended and impervious area on the property. Uh, you'll take a, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But why is it an impervious area? It's because the, uh, the impervious is what causes the issue. If it's impervious, it tends to, tends to soak into the ground less and saturate from heavy rains and such. But if it's a good, it's a good measure of a way to make, make parity with the, um, the system. And the things we want to consider, and I hope you'll think about as we're talking tonight, is is it fair to everybody in the community? Is it easy to implement and administer? Uh, is it easy for our, our citizens to understand? Is it affordable? Will we be able to, to cover our costs? And are, are we in parity with our uh, peer communities, our city of Delaware, our city of Westerville, or just other communities that have stormwater utilities in place? We want to be make sure we're in line with them and not be way out of, out of whack. Next slide. Um, so what would we use them for here in Sunbury? Well, there's just a few things. Uh, we've got about 28 miles of storm sewer infrastructure that uh, is rapidly aging. And as you know, as, our infrastructure, as infrastructure ages, it gets more expensive every year to repair if you do deferred maintenance. So if you can take care of it, doing that as a preventive maintenance, it'll save a lot of money. But if you don't have money to do that, you're, you eventually are having to, to spend 
uh, large amounts on replacement. Uh, help us maintain the six bridges in the town, uh, all of those on Prairie Run and other structures similar to that, culverts and, and such. Um, help us stay in line with state and federal regulatory programs like the MS4 program, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, let, give us the opportunity, if we want, to do some green infrastructure in the community, whether it's implementing into subdivisions or our own approach to that with, uh, with existing systems. Manage floodplains. Uh, assist with your capital improvement program with uh, by funding those stormwater components of that. And also assist with illicit discharge, which uh, leads to, you know, there's that, that crossover, so to speak, with sanitary sewers and help us deal with some of that too. There's a part of the MS4 program that's the illicit discharge detection elimination program that, that can be funded with this program with a utility. Next slide. Um, so how, how does it work? I mentioned earlier it's based uh, large, normally based on impervious area. Uh, we'll have our GIS text go through and basically take a, a random sampling, but a representative sampling of lots in the community and see what the what the typical um, square footage of an impervious area is. That that square footage is then used as correlated to what's called an ERU, an equivalent residential unit. Every citizen that has a, a normal size lot would pay for pay that amount per month or, or pay for that uh, base per month. But the larger users, say like Kroger or Showa or somebody that has a lot of impervious area, you would take you would, uh, calculate the impervious area in their property, divide it by the ERU, multiply it by the ERU rate, and that's what they would pay monthly. Um, typically, it's between five and fifty. Well, probably between four and. $20 a month, um, I would suggest we stay on the lower end of that, at least initially, maybe put an escalation in it, but uh, stay down, stay low. But so this, that's an example calculation on the screen there. Um, not real complicated, but it gives you an idea how this works. Next slide. Then uh, the customers, it's, it's not just a single family, as I mentioned, it's also uh, need to treat different users differently. The single family would be treated, as I mentioned earlier, the multifamily would be an equivalent calculation to what I showed with the ERUs, as with those larger commercial properties. Okay. Uh, so the, there's a lot of elements to stormwater. This is sort of a, I guess, more of an academic slide here, but the types of things that we would want to consider are upgrades to our systems. Uh, that's modeling assessments, they're looking at local drainage products, projects, sorry, uh, the system maintenance, taking care of that 28 miles of storm sewer, uh, maintaining our channels or streams, such as what the project we've got going on, uh, on uh, the Walnut with that stabilization project, and just take care of routine preventive maintenance or things like back trucks and, and that sort of stuff. Um, floodplain, uh, if you've got any issues with floodplain reviews, this will help fund that and uh, assist with any education so the citizens or developers are looking to, to uh, potentially develop in the floodplain. Uh, regulations, um, stormwater, stormwater design manual would probably be pretty well, uh, well placed in this community right now to kind of revise the subdivision regulations, the regulations to pull the stormwater out, focus specifically on that. I just did that recently for Fairfield County and it's, it's made things a lot more clear with the developers and with the finished product that comes through with, with what they've got going. Um, and then again, training. I mentioned the stormwater or the water quality, that would be the MS4 permit um, to, to maintain that, maybe implement some green infrastructure, and then any policy issues that we may decide to implement as a part of this program. It, it just gives you a wide menu of things that you can use this, as long as it's stormwater related, environmental related, you can use these funds for, for those things. And, Probably some things that have been unintentionally uh, deferred over time just because they're expensive. Next slide. Um, there is one thing that um, I just want to take a short minute here to, to recognize that there is an opportunity for residents and businesses to lower their monthly rate by doing some green infrastructure themselves. There um, an argument that can easily be made that that improves the runoff the water quality and the volume and the peak rates that come off of their sites. So we would, uh, if we implement this utility and develop our stormwater credits, we'd want to, our stormwater rate, we'd also want to develop a credit program. Uh, it's 
Not that common for citizens, residents to do that, but it's very common for uh, developers to do that, particularly on new development, even with such things as green roofs or um, you know, lead, lead style buildings, that sort of thing. Next slide. So I mentioned our 28 miles of sewer. There it is. Um, you can see when a lot of it happened that 2008 to 2023, um, and the condition of the, the old, so I know that. The condition of the older sewers are, are not that great. Those are the ones we'll probably need to spend some significant money on. Uh, same with the 61 to 80s. And then, uh, of course, we can uh, just do some preventive maintenance on the newer sewers. So, yeah, but, but the cost, if we had to replace the entire sewer, it would be uh, probably more than 26 million. Uh, realistically, it probably would be pretty easy to spend $6 million to do some. Uh, we have rehab work and maintain those systems so that they're functioning properly and, and have a longer useful life. I hit on that just for a second. Anytime I talk to residents and we start talking about, you know, what are tax dollars used for? And it's pretty easy to explain the stuff you can see with your eyes. But it, when you start having them kind of visualize, okay, what is beneath the ground? I'm really glad you, you quantified the figure there for us. That's a, I mean, that's a really good talking point. I mean, by far, our underground infrastructure is, you know, our largest asset liability. So you're exactly right. To the, uh, we all tend to take for granted what we don't see, but when we turn on our water or flush our toilets and everything works fine, we take it for granted. If it doesn't, then it's a big problem, and you know we get all upset about it. It's, right. Um, it's just it's just glossed over in our day day to day lives. Here, this this slide is really just an opportunity to show you the subdivisions that we looked at. And it's, um, did those metrics for the sewers that, that are in place um, in the year that they were done. But this actually, I believe Wes had done an initial inventory up in 2008, and uh, we went through from 2008 to, to 2023 through those subdivisions and got a, a good accounting of what how much sewer is or will be in those as well. And uh, this is just a little uh, interesting bit of trivia. We've got two two streams to the community to so this part of the community starting out west we'll play another one we'll on that but the prairie run um it's a 4.4 square mile watershed it seems to be a little flashy and it will have some flood flooding issues with that um that's something that can be looked at studied and potentially some uh, uh accommodations made to to lower the flooding lessen the impact to uh to structures to residents and roads. Big Walnut Creek, um, that's a big watershed. That goes all the way up to Mount Gilead. Uh, thankfully, that doesn't doesn't really affect us as much except for on Walnut Road and down there along the Granville Street at the, uh, at the bridge. At, uh, but it is a big watershed and these things are included with the stormwater utility. If we have problems and need to address issues with them, it's, we can do that. Um, I mentioned the bridges on Prairie Run. We got these five bridges, um, and they're in reasonably good shape. The um, Prairie Run con span, I know, uh, has some some stress on it during some floods. I've seen it, seen water pretty high there. The um, I believe it's in, yeah the Middle View Drive. Uh, it's, you can see that the picture is down in the bottom. I don't mean you may not necessarily think of these as bridges or large culverts or con spans, but they're uh, they're considered to be bridges. But uh, you can see the middle view down there at number two. It's really very out, very aged, and uh, has some hydraulic issues with it that uh, that may need some attention in the near future, and, and probably cost uh, they're about close to four hundred thousand dollars to repair. Next slide. Uh, I think you're all aware of this document, or this form that we're hoping that we all will use as we talk to residents or just on our own observe concerns that, that uh, are related to stormwater. That will give us an idea. It'll, and one thing will do is it will arm us with some ammo to, to, to make that case for the stormwater utility, but it also allows us to, to truly understand what our issues are. Whether utility gets in place or not, it's very, very valuable information, and I, uh, I think it's on the OneDrive. I'd, I'd strongly encourage you to uh, maybe print out a couple and hand them out to anybody that's got some concerns. Collect them, do them yourselves, but uh, I'd, and you can send these directly to me, or I can pick, come over and pick them up. 
Can we also have staff do this? I mean, I think our folks like uh, wastewater treatment plant and services employees are out there every single day. Absolutely. Can we ask them to fill these out for us? I can ask the police as well. And uh, Brad and Steve and, and Daryl already gave me a few, and Wes and I have talked about some. So we have some on the list, which I'll show you here in a little bit. All right. Uh, but again, this will identify capital improvement program uh, issues to address in the future related to stormwater. Next. So I talked about the MS4 program. This is a federal program that was, was part of the Clean Water Act, which was passed in 1972, Nixon administration, and uh, has been increasingly uh, intensified over the years. The MS4 program has probably been in place for maybe 15, 20 years. And uh, it has addressed these issues from a regulatory perspective, and they expect communities, cities particularly, like Sunbury, to uh, account, to take care of these four, these uh, six things I call minimum control measures. Uh, we've contracted with Soil and Water Conservation District to take care of uh, one, one, two, and six primarily. I think they help, then they help a little bit with, with four. By the way, another thing that this program can do is fund these inspectors to go out and look at these construction sites for inspection because it's relatively intense, especially after a rainstorm, it, it becomes a burden and that we could fund somebody to, to do that kind of work for us as well. But the MS4 program is relatively intense. The EPA does audit communities to make sure you're um, complying with every one of these minimum control measures and, and they will, they have fined communities for not doing that. I don't suggest that somebody's in that situation, but I've seen it happen uh, in a couple of communities and it's, it's really not very fun. Um, but it's not that hard to do, but it does take some time and it takes some money to, to implement. Um, so that's that's pretty much the uh, down and dirty of the stormwater programs. Uh, this is, these are the items that were listed on the uh, first slide there with the agenda about what it is we wanted to, to accomplish. I just want to go over them again, and, and that's what, what are we currently doing? I'm not saying we do this tonight, but uh, make sure I understand what's currently being addressed for stormwater management, how an MS4 program is being managed, what priorities we see for the next five years, maybe 10, 20 years as well. Uh, look, at, look at programs and identify costs for those programs. And uh, of course, we need to evaluate what kind of potential revenue we can get to see uh, how that funding will work for us. Um, uh, we'll talk about obstacles, which is maybe something we might want to discuss tonight. And then the next steps after that, uh, once a go decision is made, and that was the rest of the uh, task order that, had written, that Wes and I had written for completing a stormwater utility for the community. Uh, so the, the next step right now is to have that workshop. <clears throat> so I'll work with Steve Darrell to. Uh, decide who should be in that workshop, <clears throat> when we'll hold it, how we'd like to handle it. I'd see it more as of a more of a charrette, uh, you know, town hall type of opportunity where we might have some boards up and talk about, you know, what issues we know of, ask them about issues that they may have, and then uh, discuss with them what impacts, good and bad, that this may have to them as business owners, as residents, as uh, elected officials and such. Um, but you can go on the next slide, Those, that last part isn't uh, relevant. So with some of the, these are the uh, some of the issues we discussed addressing. I think I've hit on many of these tonight. Um, the things that I think are interesting, and I really enjoyed Dale's presentation on the Vactor truck, um, having done that myself not too long ago at the city, city of Worthington, although we got the big one, Dale. <laughs> it's a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, but that, yeah, that's so those kind of things can be funded out. This I'm not suggesting they'll wait until some utilities programs in place to get that. But uh, a CCTV truck is also another type of equipment that could be uh, developed with that, which would give them an opportunity to to really understand what's going on in the sewers with a with a quality camera, quality equipment in that truck to do the investigation. Uh, software, hardware. Those things can be funded by that, and we will want some of that when we're doing some modeling of the stormwater systems and trying to understand what impacts we're doing will have on the on the global issues. And you can put a weather station in; it helps us uh, keep a, a good history of the weather that occurs and what impacts it, it had uh, to different areas of the community. And again, that was another thing we did in Wellington. We got a, you know, a 
rain gauge, a, a sophisticated rain gauge that, that gave you readout at the computer at your desk. You didn't have to go read it every after every rain. And we included, you know, humidity and wind speeds and those sort of kind of things in there as well. It's, it's kind of handy when you're doing things like fighting the snow and ice or dealing with flooding and, and other issues like that. It's a relatively useful thing. Programmatically, as I mentioned, we can uh, uh, fund the program administration for the MS4. And it, eventually, I'd strongly suggest that a lot of communities would do to, to hire a stormwater coordinator, take some of the burden off of these guys, and they own Brad is, you know, as this city continues to grow and add more and more properties, it's, you're just going to have more and more issues that, that need to be handled. And uh, that person can, can do that. And it could be a it could be a position that's half funded with stormwater utility, half funded with sanitary. You know, we can you know brainstorm that at some point in the future. Uh, it would fund our stormwater conservation district contract, which is not real expensive, but it's still a cost. Yeah, it's about seven thousand. Yeah, no, but still, it's something we can cover with this. And, and I think I, well, I know we'd want to continue to keep them involved. In fact, they're uh, we met with them last week, and they're very willing to help us as advocates for this program because they're very familiar with it, uh, experts in it. I mentioned the stormwater design manual, I mentioned construction inspection, and we could also do the post-construction maintenance issues with uh, ones that, that the city owns. Um, and the, the actual projects there on the, the column all the way to the left, I don't think I need to go through each one of those, but uh, I'm sure you're familiar with just about all of them, except maybe the IDDE program. That is the illicit discharge detection and elimination. It is part of the MS4. Uh, and that, that can help uh, help in numerous ways. It can take storm storm out of the sanitary so we don't have to treat it with our brand new water, wastewater plant and, uh, and uh, get sanitary out of our storm sewers as well if that's happening anywhere. That's, that's not fun either. Um, so next slide. Um, we want to... It's a good idea to understand our advantages and disadvantages of a program like this. I think the advantages are pretty obvious. And then I think, honestly, the disadvantages are relatively obvious, too. These are, we talked about it in some of them my own ads, but um, this will probably be seen as a, as a tax, and taxes aren't popular. I, what you need to balance that with is the benefits that will come out of it. And I, I think we can make a case that there will be a lot of them, um, but it's something we need to. Keep in mind with every discussion we have, and uh, keep in mind if we go forward with this program that, that it's not all it's not all uh, unicorns and bunnies. It's uh, sometimes it can be a little uh, intense. Uh, and, and if you all have any, we can have a discussion of that. I think the next slide is question. Oh, next steps. Uh, we'll go back to the advantages and disadvantages at the end time. Uh, next steps are finalize this needs assessment summary, go through those projects that we need to do, go through the um, the uh, infrastructure, create a five-year ballpark budget. At this at this point in the game, we're not quite ready to do that. That will be more intense study that will happen if we decide to make a go with the stormwater utility. And we need to get with, uh, with Kathy or Dana to uh, talk about potential revenue, uh, what how much we think we can collect with this if we have what, 2,000 households or so, and then however many businesses we have and try to get a decent idea of what kind of potential we have for collection of revenue and know that that will, that will give us an opportunity to decide what we can fund over time as well. We'll need to do that stakeholder workshop. I prefer to do that after we do some of these other things so we have some more questions answered. Continue to identify our advantages and disadvantages or obstacles and solutions, and then decide if it's a go or no go. Um, that's when the rubber will hit the road. At the shortly after that workshop, we'll have to sit down and decide whether we want to do this or not. Um, so that's that's it. Didn't take too long. I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't know that I have any questions right off the bat. But thank you very much for presenting that. Kind of posed the entire situation in a light that maybe we didn't all have a really great visibility of, especially regarding the infrastructure costs. Mm -hmm. uh, that this could help defray for the city. 
Yeah, I'll just mention a couple of things. I, I really like the idea of the credit. I've seen other municipalities do that. I know Newark has made a really intentional effort on developing their streetscape with rain gardens and pervious services. Yes. Um, you know, they've got that old canal that runs along the city, uh, kind of their town square, mm -hmm. um, and they've done a really good job maintaining uh, water levels in and around their square. I, I just want to mention some of the things you saw in terms of infrastructure replacement. We're paying for those today, um, or we're deferring the cost and liability. Uh, we're paying for them out of things like our streets budget or uh, the general fund, um, storm drains in particular. Sometimes we incorporate those into our streets program and uh, dollars get blended. This is a way to really isolate that cost. That's, that's a fantastic point. It allows you to, to, to move money away from there or you know, burden away from there to use it for other things or for what it was originally intended for. Right. Yeah, that's separate. So I mentioned just a couple other things. It's either pay now or pay later, continue to defer. And I mean, the, the reason I would push for this is we're waiting for a catastrophe to happen. The last thing we want to do is have the Prairie Run Creek overflow its bounds. It's been very, very close over the past couple of years. It seems like it's increasing in frequency and magnitude. And this is a way that not only we show the public that we're addressing it, but we legitimately, not from a public relations standpoint, we're trying to prevent tragedy from happening. And I've been right for just a second. One thing I did forget to mention too is if there's a utility in place, the opportunity to get funding from EPA and DNR, those kind of things is, is in hand. Right. They look to see that in the fact that you're a serious community about those issues. I agree. Thanks for your time. Absolutely. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Great yeah. work. Thank you. Does anybody have anything else for good of the order? We've got just a couple minutes left. I do. Uh, yes. Crack sealer. Do we oh, okay. do we get that into the agenda and council? We're going to bring it to the next council right. meeting. Yep. The next council meeting. Yep. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. This has a backdrop and maybe a very expensive council meeting. <laughs> Also, I, I do have one other thing um, related to snow plowing. And I want to say our crews over the uh, pre-Christmas blizzard of 22 um, did a great job. Uh, the conditions were not very favorable for melting snow. I got so cold so fast. Uh, even though you were driving on crunched ice, it still seemed very safe. I talked to the police afterwards. I think we had a couple minor incidents. Um, but we need to do a better job getting the word out that people should do everything in their power to get off the roads. I rode around in our biggest snowplow truck with Brad for two hours. I can't tell you like the amount of inefficiency that we have in clearing other streets that really need it because we're bobbing and weaving down neighborhood streets. Um, not only are we inefficient, we're ineffective because then we're plowing in cars and it just causes a lot of headaches. I know some folks can't park in their driveway. I, I totally understand that. But the amount of cars that we had out on Sunbury Meadows Drive, uh, specifically in Sunbury Estates, was probably the worst um, all over that neighborhood and thin streets. Uh, we would be able to get these big plows plowing more snow more effectively if we can get the word out. Um, and if we have to enforce it, then we'll enforce it from a police standpoint. But uh, I can't thank those guys enough. Um, I was out on Christmas Eve for a couple hours. You know when you hit a curb, by the way, if you can't see it, uh, you feel that you're jarred around pretty good, um, even though those trucks look big and comfortable. Uh, right. When you hit something, you know it. Thank goodness we didn't have any mailboxes or cars. Yeah. Thanks to those guys. So I had. I remembered at 2.30 in the morning during the initial blizzard that I needed to get my car. So <laughs> I went down and cold. pulled it up. It was very cold. It was, it was rough. All right. Do we have anything else for good of the order? All right, then. I will move to adjourn. Can I get a second? Second by Mr. Neff. Roll call. Mr. Kappel? Yes. Mr. Neff? Yes. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Mayor St. John? Yes. We are adjourned at 7.20.